Hi, friends. Again, it is Pastor Henry. Pastor Brooke. From Arab First United Methodist Church. And here is our final video. We're going to spend a little bit of time recapping what happened at General Conference. Um, some of this is going to cover ground that we've already talked about in our previous videos, but hopefully we can work out the understanding just a little bit better yeah. to make it plain for everyone. Yeah, so Pastor Henry and I went to Huntsville. Uh, we went to Trinity in Huntsville last week um, where they had a debrief session for all the clergy in um, the North Alabama Conference. This is one of two, so they did it in the area that's closest to you, and so that's where we went. Um, and we had a really good debrief session. We heard from the delegates um, and the bishop that were at General Conference. They sort of told us what it felt like in the room at the time mm -hmm. and um, gave us, a again, updates that you've probably already read about, heard about, um, but gave us some more clear information. And so we're ready to share that with yeah, you. So we want to just talk a little bit about that. Um, one of these is regionalization. And again, this is a word that doesn't mean a lot to non-Methodist folks and even yeah. to a lot of our own Methodist folks. But what this means is it was a package of legislation that is essentially going to turn the United States into a central conference like all the other conferences are around the world. Yep. Now, why why do that? Um, when the United Methodist, or even before the United Methodist Church mm -hmm. was set up, excuse me, when the Methodist Church came back from the Methodist Episcopal North, the Methodist Episcopal South, it came together. They set up a governance based on the U.S. government governmental system that yep. we have. Yep. That's why we have a, a council of bishops as our um, executive branch, general conferences, legislative, and judicial council mm -hmm. as judicial. It, it, it's genius <laughs> and it's um uh anyway primarily u.s centric with just a couple of missions outside the united states yeah well what we've seen is those areas have grown and and have now become a large part of the church and they have real needs that need to be addressed and what we did along the way was we allowed them to address those needs that don't apply to the u.s church yeah. mm -hmm. um and, and so that's how they develop. Well, now what has happened, there are so many things that have to be done at General Conference, at our legislative branch meeting that meets every yeah. four years, um, but that only apply to the U.S. church. For instance, um, one of the longer sessions on one of our afternoons was all about the U.S pension plan. Yeah. Um, can you imagine how frustrating that must be to Absolutely. Um, members of, of different countries? They have to talk about how we do our, our pensions. They, they have a lot of other things that are pressing to us. Yes. However, if you're someone who is in need of a pension, that's a big deal. Yeah. So what regionalization does is it allows for certain things to take place mm -hmm at the regional level in the United States, just like it does at the central conferences. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that everything is a free-for-all now, and I'm going to read this straight from the document. All regions will be required to adhere to the core parts of the United Methodist Church Book of Discipline outlining our church mission, doctrinal standards, and essentials of our faith. Part 1 through 5, Constitution, General Book of Discipline, Doctrinal Standards, and our Theological Task, the Ministry of All Christians, and Social Principles. All of those things are still going to be held yep. together. You can't change those at a regional level. Right. But everything else, you know, let's say maybe the makeup of a district trustee board or a pension plan, mm -hmm. that is things that can be more central to your context. Yeah, it, it goes on to explain regional conferences would have the authority to adapt the parts of the Book of Discipline focused on organization and administration so that items related to their context and missional realities can be decided at a more local level. Essentially saying, like, let's be missionally effective mm -hmm. in our places. You know, that way when we come together every four years, we can better focus yeah. on things that do matter to the global church. Exactly. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with this. Yeah, me too.
to. All right, some more changes. Um, let's talk about the language regarding uh, human sexuality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was a, a, a big change that, that happened. You will see um, a lot of this work, if you watch the live stream at all, this was done in committee and then voted on as part of the consent a- mm-hmm. agenda. So there was only a, a couple of amendments that really got some, some major debate um, on, on the floor. But what happened at the 2024 General Conference was it neutralized language about weddings and ordination by removing sections in the Book of Discipline that prohibited persons in same-gender relationships from being ordained and same-gender weddings from taking place in our churches or being officiated by the United Methodist clergy. This takes us back to pre-1972 language in the Book of of Discipline. and as we noted in one of our videos that our, our bishop says, this does not mean that we're all on the same page. In fact, what this means is we are not on the same page, yep. that we have been going over this issue for a very long time, and we are not settled. There are people in our congregations, there are people in our churches, laity and clergy, that are committed to full inclusion of LGBTQ plus peoples. And then there are others who are against that. They are not necessarily against LGBTQ plus as people, but they they are against weddings and they are against ordination. And what they did and are seeking to do is, y'all, this is not a fight that we can need to keep having because what we believe is we believe that as a global church, we can have people in different contexts and situations that can remain part of our church but disagree on this issue. Yeah. And so they also made some other changes that allowed for authority on making these decisions to go to local churches, local clergy, and the board and district uh, committees of mm-hmm. ordained ministry to make these decisions. For instance, a subparagraph, um, this is 416.7. The bishop shall not penalize any clergy for performing or refraining from performing a same-sex marriage service. The bishop shall neither require any local church to hold or prohibit a local church from holding a same-sex marriage service on property owned by a local church. Um, So so what that means is that that reinforces a reality that we've always had. A church is able to develop its wedding policy, yeah. its theology and understanding uh, of marriage and what that constitutes. Um, and, and a clergy can do the same mm-hmm. without the, the general church dictating that. Yeah. Yeah. And here's what I want to say about that, that I find to be um, being repeated um, in lots of different conversations, mm-hmm. is that honestly, this, this gives the local church body mm-hmm. Um, the power to work in their context. Mm -hmm. Um, And on top of that, there's no, you know, uh, penal, what do you say? No penalty. Penalty, thank you. Um, There's no penalty against anyone um, for what they choose to do. It's Mm -hmm. kind of opening up the freedom to say, Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to put this in your laps. You Mm -hmm. you know your places better than we do. Mm -hmm. And so, we're going to give it to you. Absolutely. Um, you know, this, it, it, it's it's always a tough thing and because th- there are people behind this. Yeah. Um, there are people who are celebrating this. Um, there are people who are not. Mm-hmm. Um, but to, to me, what this does is it gives us the best opportunity to keep as much of the big tent of the united methodist church as we can and i I think that that that's worthwhile um one of the things uh, actually i'll 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 wait on that and for just a little bit because we'll talk a little bit more about that in the revised social principles Mm -hmm. um we i said this from the pulpit and i want to say it again here so what does this mean for us as arab first united methodist church Really nothing, Mm -hmm. because nothing is going to change with this. We understand who we are and who our mission is. We already have a wedding policy that was revised, I believe it was the beginning of 2020. 
uh, 19, 18, 19, 20, somewhere. That is still the case. We still have the authority whether or not we're going to to make any changes to that. Yeah. Um, that that hasn't changed. That's not going to change who we are. And I, I think we can take comfort in that. There's a lot of people who who have said, well, you know, we thought this was going to happen. Okay, maybe sure, but that doesn't mean change is mandated. Yeah, um, there's still a place for conservative, progressive people who think one way, people who think the other way. I think that that's worth striving for. Yeah, and I think our vision and our mission is still the same. This doesn't change who we are as mm-hmm. a First United Methodist mm-hmm. Church. Um, we are still people who love and want everyone to experience the love of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to do that in a way that brings every makes everybody comfortable, that you're welcome to the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just talked about this in confirmation about communion, but this, it's God's. this is God's mm-hmm. kingdom, right? And so we want everybody to be a part of that. And so what we're doing is no different. We still love everyone and want everyone to experience God's love. And it's our job to help you experience God's love, to make a deep connection with God, not necessarily to tell you what to think about a particular issue. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. The next thing was the the revised social principles, and this has been a, a long process that's been going on and uh, w- w- was passed. Um, I highly encourage you to go to umc.org and read the social principles for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll probably can find a lot of people who will tell you what these social principles say, but I, I encourage you to yeah. read them for them yourself. Me too. One of the things um, that it's important saying about social principles, um, and this is in the preface, it says, the social principles are not church law. Instead, they represent the prayerful and earnest efforts of the general conference to speak to issues in the contemporary world from a sound biblical and theological foundation that is in keeping with the best of our United Methodist traditions. The social principles are thus a call to faith faithfulness and a social engagement intended to be instructive and persuasive in the best of prophetic spirit. Moreover, they challenge all members of the United Methodist Church to engage in deliberative reflection and encourage intentional dialogue between faith and practice. Um, so what does that mean? Um, you know, our, our social principles are, are not binding in the same way that our doctrine yeah. is, but they are striving to get us to be in conversation with the world around us and how we live in that. Yeah. Um, there are going to be people who disagree with our social principles. Yeah. Um, and that's okay. There are people within who disagree with our social principles. Yep. That, that's okay. Um, because there are things in them that reflect our reality as a global congregation. Um, there are things that are being dealt with in the Africa, in the Philippines, that we're not dealing with here, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, so that reflects our, again, global reality and how we're all best trying to deal with that. Yeah. Um, here's a John Wesley quote that I want to read because I think it speaks so much to what mm-hmm. we're t- sitting here talking about. It says, The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Mm-hmm. Faith working by love is the length and breadth and depth and height of Christian perfection. Mm-hmm. And that's so what we're talking about here. There was an, there was a moment where someone came to the, one of the delegates from Africa came to the floor and offered um, another statement to be added to something that they mm-hmm. were it was it was one amendment mm-hmm. and um, it was <clears throat> she said it in a way that said we want to include everybody, something that helps everybody at the table. And so um, that was a beautiful moment because what she said was great, and everybody voted yes for that. It, it was. It, it was. It was. And here, here's what she said, and it was about marriage, and says marriage within the church. Again, reflecting that within the church, we affirm marriage as a sacred, lifelong covenant that brings two people of faith, adult 
man and adult woman of consenting age or two adult persons of consenting age into union with one another and into deeper relationship with God and the religious community. You know, I, I love that for, for multiple reasons. One, that that actually represents a, an issue that Africa is dealing with on a, a couple of fronts. Because, you know, on, on the one hand, Africa is much more conservative. In, in, some, yeah. um, in some cases, um, to have a LGBTQ plus marriage is illegal. Um, Mm -hmm. And so adding the adult man and woman touches on that, but of consenting age. You know, one of the things that they have to deal with in Africa that we have to deal with much less is child, and particularly child brides. Um, and, And so this tried to deal that with ways. And, you know, something that I saw expressed quite a bit was... There are a lot of people who, if they were going to write this, they wouldn't have said it this way. Right. They were unhappy with the changes from both sides, Mm -hmm. but that this was a good compromise. And and it was a great example of how people of faith can compromise and still remain in fellowship together. Yeah. And again, what a beautiful picture of the church. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, anyway, so that was very heartwarming to me that people could come together and figure out a way to go forward together. Mm-hmm. Maybe not completely happy, mm-hmm. but satisfied with changes that were made. So anyways, I thought that was a beautiful moment. All right, what else? Um, I want to talk a little bit about one that is um, uh, particularly special to me because of some of the people I know that will mean a little bit less to some who who – maybe don't know as much about how our, our ordination works. Mm-hmm. So in, in the United Methodist Church, we have two uh, two different orders of ordination. We have elder, which is what I am. I'm, I'm called to be in a church and in a church leadership to preach, to teach, to preside over the sacraments, to lead in, in service. Um, but there's another order. It's called deacon. And, and deacon believe that, yes, they can be in the church, but their moral role is t- to connect the church to the world, and that is really, really important. Mm-hmm. Um, and up until recently, um, up until General Conference, they did not have sacramental privileges. So if you were a deacon, you had to have an elder preside and bless the sacraments. Yeah. And now they uh, they have sacramental authority. That was granted this General Conference, and and I, I love that. Me too, because here's the thing: if 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 a deacon is called to be missionally effective, connecting the church to the world, um, that doesn't always mean that there's an elder hanging out with them mm-hmm. that can randomly, you know, be mm-hmm. there to bless the sacraments, mm-hmm. right? And so um, I agree. I think that was a great big giant leap forward mm-hmm. um, in taking that step so um another fun one we talked about being full communion with the episcopal church i i I just again want to lift that up you know i i think that that's great um because it's again recognizing how we are part of the bigger body of christ which is so much more than our particular tradition um and recognize that hey we can work together um in some cases we can even you know we might share clergy. We yep. might, you know, all these different things that are, are great yeah. uh, for partnership and ministry. Yes. So excited about full communion with the Episcopal Church. Anything else? One, Just one final thing that I, I really, really liked. Um, they added, this was more of an aspirational uh, amendment, but I think it's, um, I, I love it. A new paragraph was added to the Book of Discipline that says, with a spirit of grace, we welcome those churches which have disaffiliated or have withdrawn to rejoin the United Methodist Church. Where applicable, every annual conference shall have a policy of reaffiliation for the churches seeking to return to the connection. Each such policy shall require that reaffiliating churches affirm their commitment to the trust clause. They, that was something that was, that was added um, to that. But I, you know, and we could talk about the trust clause on another date. I'm not yeah. going to get into a lot of that. But I love the spirit which that was offered yes. um, because we believe in a God that brings people back together. Yeah. Um, and we want to be a church of 
reaffirming commitments, rebuilding bridges. Um, so I, I appreciate that we put that in there. I do too, and it's it's a step of uh, good faith, right? Mm-hmm. We are we. This is who we say we are. We say we are a church of open hearts, open minds, mm-hmm. and open doors. And so, why wouldn't this be in there? Absolutely. Why wouldn't we welcome people back into the church? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I appreciate that as well. Well, y'all, uh, that is our, our recap. Um, we would love to hear questions. Um, feel mm-hmm. free to email myself, email Pastor Brooke, email the church office, and, and that will get passed along to us. If you have any further questions or what this means for us um, a, as a church, and particularly here at, at ARAB First UMC. Yep. So let us know. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. We appreciate See you. See ya.